Um, good morning. Welcome to Brown Rodney's first annual litigation funding conference. It's fantastic to see so many familiar faces here. As a word of introduction, I'm Elna Ray and I'm heading Brown Rodney's litigation funding team. The remarkable attendance here is a testament to the growth in and around the litigation funding industry. We have delegates here flying from Australia, the United States, Dubai and Europe. We're delighted to host this conference in this very special place so that together we can turn our attention to some of the important themes as well as opportunities and challenges facing the industry today. This is also a deal makers conference. We have invited various players in the industry, from litigation funders to family offices and sponsors investing in the funders, corporate and institutional claimants, teams that source claims, insurance providers, UK and European litigation law firms, and many other players in the litigation funding space. So we hope that you will take advantage of being face-to-face -face and meeting new colleagues uh, over lunch and our drinks reception this evening. I would like to thank all of our very impressive panelists for taking the time to, for share their, to share their insights with us and to everyone who is here today. So to begin with, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Gary Barnard, Executive Director and General Counsel of the International Legal Finance Association. Congrats. Good morning, and thank you to Brown Rudnick for hosting this conference, and I truly commend Elena for all of the hard work and thought she put into making our gathering today a success. It is an honor to be opening a conference of such distinguished leaders from in and around the legal finance community. The International Legal Finance Association, or ILFA, is the only global association representing the commercial legal finance industry. Our members, many of whom are in the room today, are located and do business around the globe. Our industry grow, as our industry grows, the need to engage, educate, and influence legislative, regulatory, and judicial authorities about our business grows along with it. And that is a key part of ILFA's mission, both from a global perspective and in specific jurisdictions. We believe it is important to speak globally but to also act locally. To accomplish this, ILFA has established chapters in the UK, continental Europe, Australia, and the United States. As many of you know, there are certain business organizations that spend a great deal of time and money lobbying for regulations that would hinder or completely prohibit financing. While we can only speculate about their motives, it seems fair to assume that they believe limiting access to legal finance will prevent meritorious litigation from being brought against them or those they represent. As an aside, it is ironic that many of the members of these organizations are themselves users of legal finance. Nevertheless, these organizations continue their crusade against the industry. In recent years, we have seen near con a near constant stream of legislative and regulatory efforts in Australia, the EU, and the US, as well as proposals before international arbitration bodies, like the UN Commission on International Trade Law. Since its inception, ILFA has actively and successfully engaged wherever these threats arise. It is especially encouraging when policymakers take the time to learn and truly understand our industry and the benefits it provides to business and society. Over the years, the legal finance community has gravitated towards communicating our value proposition through key phrases that define the benefits provided by commercial legal finance. We are, quote, we are, quote, pro-business. We, quote, level the playing field. We provide access to justice. While these are all accurate descriptions of commercial legal finance, transcending all of them is the advancement of the rule of law. And that is what I want to talk about today. There is no better place to talk about this concept than in England, which has contributed so much to what the world now identifies as the rule of law. 
I think it is fair to say that the rule of law is one of England's greatest exports. However, the longer we live under the rule of law in our communities or in our countries, the more it is taken for granted. We often forget what is needed to support it and what we need to do to protect it. Its importance cannot be overstated in this age of insecurity. Protecting and upholding the rule of law has never been more important. As A.V. Dicey, an Oxford legal scholar from the 19th century noted, quote, foreign observers of English manners, such for example as Voltaire, De Lome, Tocqueville, or Neist, have been far more struck than Englishmen themselves with the fact that England is a country governed as is scarcely any other part of Europe under the rule of law. As an industry, we should make it our charge to remind others about what the rule of law is, how rare it is in our world's history, that it is undeniably fragile, and that our institutions must identify and support those who uphold it. So when Dicey says the rule of law, what does he mean? His form formulation incorporated three concepts. First, that laws come from lawful authority, not the whim of those in power. Second, that no one is above the law, whoever they are. And third, that we need courts to adjudicate disputes and the principles of law arise from, revolution, from resolution of those cases. More contemporary philosophers have built upon Dicey's framework. John Rawls, a 20th century moral and legal philosopher at Harvard, defined the rule of law as, quote, the regular, impartial, and in this sense, fair administration of public rules. Professor Larry Solom, a legal theorist now at the University of Virginia, outlines Rawls' formulation of the rule of law in a helpful schematic form. First, the requirement of that compliance be possible. Second, the requirement of regularity. Third, the requirement of publicity. Fourth, the requirement of generality. And fifth, and finally, the requirement of due process, that the legal system should provide fair and orderly procedures for the determination of cases. The importance of this final requirement of due process cannot be overstated. The entire structure falls apart without it. In both common law and civil law jurisdictions, we rely on an adversarial system where the parties to a lawsuit are responsible for the development of the law. Civil actions do not reach the courts without a party initiating the action. Courts rely on the parties for a full adversarial presentation of ideas and legal arguments. What does society as a whole gain from these features of the rule of law? First, the rule of law provides predictability and certainty. When the law is predictable and certain, it functions as a guide for conduct and to protect rights, whether human or contractual. When we have the rule of law, citizens and businesses can plan their conduct in, confor in conformity with the law. Professor Solom asks us to focus on what the world would be like if there were systemic and serious departures from the requirements of the rule of law. He asks, what if the laws were secret? What if officials were immune from the law and could act as they pleased? What if the systems of procedure were almost completely arbitrary so that the results of the legal proceedings were random or reflected the whims and prejudices of judges? What if some classes of people were above the law? What if other classes were below the law and denied the law's protections? In other words, the rule of law serves as a bulwark against tyranny, chaos, and injustice. Time, as well as blood, sweat, and tears have made these concepts more applicable around the globe. Unfortunately, there are too many places where these foundations of the rule of law are still evolving or being called into question. It is a work in progress. So many of you might be thinking, okay, really, legal finance can help with all of that? My answer to you too is yes, it absolutely can. As the eminent British judge, Lord Tom Bingham, wrote in The Rule of Law, the lawyers are expected to lay before the judge all the material necessary to decide the case, and the judge, as the neutral referee, has to decide which case he prefers. The more professional and higher caliber the representation, the better the legal arguments presented to the court. 
All of this is necessary for judges to get the law right. It is what makes the law and our legal systems work. This was specifically identified by Tom Bingham as a requirement of the rule of law. Quote, an unenforceable right or claim is a thing of little value to anyone, end quote. We in this room all know that high quality representation is not inexpensive. Litigation costs are an unfortunate reality. Bingham understood this as well. Few people, he explained, are competent to assess the strength of a claim and, con and conduct litigation without professional help. But solicitors and barristers, like plumbers and electricians, ordinarily charge a fee. And since litigation is a highly labor-intensive, is, since the litigation is highly labor intensive with even a small case usually demanding more hours of work than, for instance, the longest surgical, surgical operation, the costs tend to be high. The cost of litigation has only increased since Bingham wrote the rule of law. As a legal community, and more generally as citizens, we must work to alleviate the threat these costs pr present to the rule of law. Of the many solutions to these rising costs, legal finance plays an important role. This is how we should approach each of the topics on today's agenda. For example, litigation funding and ESG, the rise of class actions, enforcement and monetization of awards. Addressing and supporting each of these is vital to maintaining the rule of law. To these, we can also add access to representation, ability to afford quality counsel, and support for international arbitration to the list of benefits that legal finance provides. As was noted by Tom Bingham, no one, not even a lawyer, is capable of defending their own rights without the ability to obtain access to competent representation. By providing access to competent representation, legal finance enables the pursuit of meritorious claims which would otherwise be prevented due to lack of funding. Restricting the availability of legal finance to those who have been wronged prevents them from holding wrongdoers accountable and recovering the compensation for their losses that justice requires. Lack of legal finance along allows wrongdoers to ignore the laws and thus undermines the rule of law. By enabling the pursuit of meritorious claims on behalf of corporations and individuals, legal finance creates a, a quality of resources also referred to as, qual as a quality of arms between unequal parties, which contributes to the equal protection of the laws. For example, to counter well-funded and organized parties, claimants require both financial and organizational resources, as well as data gathering and the testimony of top experts. All of this is often too expensive for the vast majority of affected parties. Without legal finance, many meritorious actions are beyond the means of injured claimants. Similarly, the rule of law requires quality counsel on both sides of a claim. Recall what Tom Bingham said. The proper adjudic adjudication of disputes requires the work of counsel to make the best arguments and legal analysis for the court's consideration. Society as a whole benefits from having the necessary legal resources dedicated to adjudicating a legal issue. Better legal arguments help judges reach the correct outcome, the outcome that is consistent with the law and consistent across cases. In our engagements with policymakers, we have found that they us are usually most interested to learn that legal finance is emphatically pro-business, which is good for the rule of law. Let me now explain why. Successful and dynamic business and commerce allows societies to thrive, providing the means by which individuals can work together to provide for themselves and their families and to engage productively with one another. Without robust and competitive commercial environments, there will be nothing of value for the law to protect. And of course, a flourishing commerce provides the tax revenue to support the essential community services provided by government. Without the rule of law, the commerce and business that is essential to human flourishing would be at risk. The rule of law creates a stable environment where plans can be made, property can be secured, expectations can be relied upon, complaints can be lodged, and rights can be protected. 
The availability of legal finance allows businesses to protect their interests in bringing or defending against a legal claim without removing necessary capital from everyday business operations. Legal finance helps companies use their capital more efficiently and deliver more value to their businesses, enhancing shareholder, employer, and client value. Increasingly, legal finance is used in ways resembling specialty corporate finance. Businesses ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies, as well as law firms of all types and sizes, use legal finance to move cost and risk off corporate balance sheets to free up capital for core business purposes and to enhance risk management. This all supports both commerce and the rule of law. Getting competent, competent representation is all well and good, but recall Bingham, quote, an unenforceable right or claim is a thing of little value to anyone. This can equally be said about a monetary judgment. An unenforced judgment is of little value to anyone. So for the rule of law to be achieved, judgments must be satisfied. Yet, a 2018 litigation finance survey found that 59% of respondents reported having uncollected recoveries or unenforced judgments of $10 million or more. Enforcing these judgments can take years, further increasing the cost of litigation. Here again, legal finance can rectify this deficiency in the rule of law. Legal finance companies have become experts in enforcing judgments through investigative and asset tracing capabilities. Legal financiers are also increasingly providing award and judgment monetization. Monetization offers immediate liquidity to companies, allowing them to invest in its business as they await the final recovery. It also reduces the risk to the company as to what the final recovery amount will be. By both financing and managing the enforcement action, legal financing helps companies advance the rule of law. For all of these reasons, we should want more access to legal finance, not less. And the decision to utilize it should be left to the business needs of individual companies, rather than to regulators or interest groups. This is the case that ILFA was founded to make. Which brings me to my final point. The benefits of legal financing transcend the rule of law within individual countries. The rule of law is crucial to the flow of international investment from more to less developed countries. As the UN Global Compact states, quote, governments need to have good laws, institutions, and processes in place to ensure accountability, stability, equality, and access to justice for all. As the UN further recognizes, conflict, insecurity, weak institutions, and limited access to justice remain a great threat to sustainable development. Many investors are now required to make investment decisions based on environmental and sustainable development standards, of which adherence to the rule of law is central. A lack of available sources of funding to pay for the cost of enforcing these international treaty obligations against host states increase the risk to foreign investors, causing them to divert capital away from those least developed countries. This further, de further deters foreign investment from countries where access to justice and accountability is now in short supply. Without legal finance to enable wronged investors from taking legal action to holding offending states to their treaty obligations and recover compensation for their losses, these states will ignore their obligations with impunity. This will undermine the rule of law in territories where it is most needed to encourage responsible, sustainable investments. Fortunately, the, the use and acceptance of legal finance throughout the world is growing. Many jurisdictions have developed a legislative or judicial acceptance of legal finance. For instance, in Switzerland, the federal Supreme Court has not only found legal finance to be permissible, it has clarified that part of the of lawyer's professional duty established in the Federal Act on Freedom of Movement for Lawyers is to inform claimants about the availability of legal financing. In addition, jurisdictions are increasingly changing their laws to permit legal finance, such as in Hong Kong, Singapore, and India, to name a few. Here in England, the government has opted to allow funders to self-regulate with the establishment of the Association of Litigation Funders of England and Wales's Code of Conduct. Legal finance is thoroughly developed here, which is unsurprising 
as London remains the world's leading international disputes hub. This is all thanks to the enormous talent pool and level of sophistication of lawyers, judges, and courts across disciplines, a favorable pro-business culture, and a respect for the rule of law. These developments are all very good news for the rule of law that benefits society as a whole. The rule of law is the glue that affords us the ability to feel secure and to prosper. Legal finance supports the rule of law, which is why ILFA's focus is to ensure the industry continues to grow in a sustainable way to be as competitive as possible, to increase the availability of funding, and to better serve users of legal finance. Let me once again thank Brown Rundnick and Elena for inviting me to speak today and thank all of you for coming. The more we promote the understanding of our industry, the more will be utilized and the more we'll be able to reinforce the rule of law at home and help it grow worldwide. And that is not only good news for every one of us in this room today, it is also good news for our businesses, our families, and our communities across the globe. Thank you.